Okay, today we are looking at the narrow gate of self-discovery. This is based on a statement from Jesus, as you would guess. It says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. There's several things about this statement that are important for us to understand and take note of, which we'll do throughout the course of this talk. But the first thing that we look at is Jesus often used opposing imagery to illustrate the principle of oneness with God. He referred to old and new wineskins, houses built on rock and sand, good and bad fish, wheat and chaff, sheep and goats, and so on. Here he employs the imagery of wide and narrow gates. And that's an important feature to notice because we can always look at these pairs of opposites and see how they easily represent two aspects of our own consciousness. And most of the time they can be interpreted as the intellect and the intuition, or intuition and intellect. And today we're going to look at the intuition as the narrow gate, the one that is difficult to find, uh, the one that few find. The intellectual gate is the one that's wide open. The whole world is following that. And there are a lot of different ways uh, to illustrate that. But in making these comparisons between intellect and intuition, we are by no means saying one is better than the other. The question is, we're on the spiritual path. How is it that we tap into the unseen reality, the presence of God? Do we do it through the head or through the heart? Do we do it through the intellect or through the intuition? When Jesus talked about God as spirit and God must be worshipped in spirit, he's not saying God must be intellectually worshipped. That's the way the world does it. We have a set of beliefs that we follow, a set of practices, a set of rituals we go through, that we have uh, learned from childhood. And we go through those week after week or day after day, however often we involve ourselves with those. And it's pretty much a head trip. It's pretty much a memorized thing that we do. But very few people have a direct experience with God. And people that do have a direct experience with God, we tend to put them in a different category. We tend to see them as someone who's special, a prophet, or a mystic, a seer. One who has abilities that most of us don't have. So what we want to say is that's not true. There's no person that's ever walked this earth that has more ability than you do to experience your oneness with God. It depends on where our attention is. And most of us have been trained to keep our attention at the intellectual, mo uh, intellectual level. Uh, the intellect is highly esteemed in this culture, so much so that intuition is kind of put on the back burner in terms of learning. So it's, but it's not to say that one is better than the other. It's a matter of putting them in perspective. On the spiritual path, we can learn many things. We can uh, memorize prayers. We can read many books. We can put much information about the spiritual principles in our heads. But then we are confronted with a situation in life that is beyond our understanding. And do we fall back on an intuitive experience or do we 
look for some more head knowledge that will help us answer the problem. And that's what we tend to do. We look for something that will resolve at the intellectual level the problem that we're having. We all do this. I'm not uh, pointing fingers at anybody because I do it just as much as anyone. It's often our first response. That we see something we don't like, we would like to change and we employ the intellect to try to, to do that rather than sit still and become aware that there is a greater power at work through us now, at this very moment. And that greater power is now unfolding itself in ways that maybe we can't even imagine. So I would classify mainstream religion as the wide gate that opens to a clearly marked superhighway of beliefs that much of the world follows. And just think of all the world religions, all the main ones, Christianity and on down. I'll start with that because that's what I grew up in and I'm most familiar with it. <clears throat> but we have, we have general statements for all of these. You know, he's a Christian, he's a Buddhist, he's a, a Muslim, he's this or that. He's, uh, you know, one of these things and that categorizes that person that makes me know something about that person I would not know otherwise. But most people are on the super highway of their, of their religion. And I love super highways. When we go back to Missouri, we always take I-70, which is pretty much a straight shot uh, back there. And then we get to uh, Salina, Kansas, I think it is. We take a right and follow the back roads down to where my mother lives in the backwoods. And uh, I actually prefer that section of the trip. But f for time and convenience, I love I-70. I love the superhighway. And that's basically why a lot of people never really question the religion they get into. It's a superhighway. Here's what you're going to believe. Here's what you believe to be part of this community. And you don't have to, you know, believe everything exactly as it's written, but this is, this is where we're at. And for you to be a part of this, if you're going to become a member of us, here's what we would expect you to embrace. And so it's like it's worked out for us. But the individual pursuit of a direct relationship with God is a narrow gate that opens to a footpath that is often only vaguely discernible to the one who takes it. I've had people through the years ask me, what does unity believe about this or that? They want us as an organization, and I'm not saying want me as a, as a minister necessarily, but us as an organization to furnish answers to a question they have, a problem they have. What does unity believe about this and that? <laughs> So what I would say is it's not what unity believes about it because unity really doesn't believe anything about it. It's up to the individual. What do you believe? Who do you say that I am? That's the question Jesus posed to the disciples. Who's everybody say that I am? Some say a prophet, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah. All right. So who do you say that I am? Because whoever you say that I am, that's what impacts your life. And that is the beginning of this narrow gate, this narrow path. So if it makes you nervous to say, it is my belief, my faith in a doctrine or whatever that determines the spiritual or the quality of my spiritual life, that may make me a little bit nervous. So I want to get into the mainstream. I want to get with a bunch of people that, you know, the, there must be, it must be okay because there's so many of them over there. So if I go associate with them, then I'll, I'll be in the fold. And yet while you're in the fold, maybe you have noticed this, you don't always feel like you're saved. You don't always feel like you've got the answer that you're seeking. You don't feel like you have that emotional connection to that power greater than yourself. It's a head thing. You're on the superhighway and you're barely noticing the scenery that goes by. 
But as you step upon your own spiritual path, you're on a path that nobody's ever been on before. There's only one you. And there's only one way that God expresses through you. There's only one way that God expresses through me. The Son of God we speak of is not Jesus. It is that spiritual essence in each one of us. And I think that's what he was talking about when he said to go pray to your Father who's in secret. Find your connection with your spiritual source. It's a narrow gate. Not everybody's going to find it. It's a difficult thing to find. But it is there. Mainstream religion, forged out of centuries-old statements of faith, rituals, and a tenacious hold on tradition, is by and large an intellectual pursuit. You don't even have to have a spiritual experience to be part of it. Yet at the beginning of each of these canonized systems of belief, we find the lone, intuitively awakened mystic who took the superhighway off-ramp and traveled instead their own unique footpath of direct revelation. Every major religion has started within another point of view. And there was somebody in that religion that did something different from other people. In the case of Jesus, I think he discovered his own inner father. He discovered his own oneness with God. And he wanted to share that with people. That became the whole object of his existence to the point where at the end of, toward the end of his life, he said, this is the whole reason I came is to share this message. You are one with God. Every individual is one with God. And keep in mind that his audience, for the most part, as I have said many times, was they were probably very poor. Some of them were actually slaves. And they would hear a message like, the kingdom of God is within you. This power that I'm talking about, this thing we call God, is within your being. You don't have to go through the synagogue to get it. You don't have to go through the priesthood to get it. You have direct connection to God. And if anything would upset the status quo of any religion, it would be someone that says something like that. Because that takes away the need for that type of control. As I pointed out, the whole notion that you are born in sin and you need a professional or a system to cleanse you of that sin so you'll be saved, it's a control mechanism. Do you believe you were born in sin? Don't raise your hands. I used to believe it because I was on the mainstream superhighway. That's what I was told to believe. You're born in sin and the evidence obviously, is Adam and Eve. Starts with them. And we inherited that problem. But it is not necessarily true. The Hebrew wrote that story for a reason. It's why do the righteous suffer? Why is life so difficult? And the answer using that story is because we're disobedient to God. And by being disobedient to God doesn't mean you're breaking Jewish law. It means we're looking out instead of within, for God is our source. And the ones that teach that are the mainstream religions, the superhighway religions. God is not within you, God is outside of you. The kingdom of God will come someday, it's not here now. So we're taught that it's not here, that I'm born in sin, I need to somehow get my get out of hell free card, which is to accept Jesus Christ as my personal savior, and I'll be okay. But I did that. And several years passed after I was dunked or immersed in 
the baptismal fountain, I still didn't feel saved. And I had to talk with my minister about that. He said, you're okay. Don't worry about it. So should I risk my entire eternal future on him saying that? I had to understand what it meant to be saved, what that meant. And actually, that doesn't mean anything. It is a religious doctrine that was created by the church. It has nothing to do with reality. Every one of our souls is absolutely free of all limitation right now, at this very moment. Our head may not be because we have bought into things. We bought into the belief that we can offend God. We have bought into the belief that we've done things that are not on the up and up. And we all know what those are. And we can't possibly be free of sin. So we have to shift, we have to take that ramp off the superhighway, get out of that way of thinking altogether, and just use spiritual logic. Most of us can accept the idea that I am an expression of God, created in the image and after the likeness of God. I like that sound, I like the feel of that. But do we really stop and think about what that means? If I'm created in the image and after the likeness of God, What's the me, what's that part of me that is created in that way? Is it the self-image that's based on my body and my age and, and all of the uh, history I've had with, in this physical incarnation? Or is there something deeper? And we have to look deeper. I am a spiritual being going through a human experience. And we really have to come to grips with that truth to make sense out of that. Otherwise, we will carry this thing because the human self does fall short. And that's what the whole word sin is about, uh, to miss the mark, to fall short. And so what we try to do is make the human self into what the soul already is. And that's what we think religion is, is trying to become a good person at the surface level. But the good news is you may not reach that level ever. The person you think you are may never ever reach the level of perfection that you think it ought to. But your soul's already been there, it's already there. And that's where it's important for us to get in touch organically through meditation with that level because it's present, does not need to be fixed, is pure, is the image and likeness of God at this moment. But see, we try to come to that realization through the head and we can't do it. We like the concept. But until we are born anew, see, many of the things Jesus said that are attributed to Jesus make sense when you look at it from this perspective. It's a new birth. It means I'm not this person I thought I was. I'm something deeper, something much more. After I prepared the talk or uh, wrote the thing, I, just, I listened to this uh, interview with this fellow. It's a, I'm going to leave the link to the YouTube uh, interview on uh, the uh, notes, the description in YouTube. So you go on that and click on it if you want to. It's, a, it's about a, it's a little over an hour long. And it is, um, he's German, so it's uh, translated, it's done through a translator. But it's a pretty interesting story. He said, I was in hell and found paradise within me. Make some Klasanovic. Is that close enough? <laughs> Had to spend eight years of his life in, a Thai, in Thai prisons. Training and an extraordinary spiritual path helped him to survive. 
in this interview, he talks about why he was arrested. He was arrested on drug charges, what he experienced in prison, and how one particular consciousness experience shaped his life. He goes into quite a bit of detail about what he experienced in this Thai prison, and it's a much different type of prison, prison system than we are, than we have here. He's in a room maybe half the size of our lobby out here with 70 other prisoners. There's no beds. They sleep on the floor. He said he had to use a plastic Coke bottle for about three months for a pillow. It's just absolute, and if you get up to go to the bathroom at night, your spot that you have on the floor will be taken up by people around you so you can't get back into it. But he described his experience as absolutely horrific. And it, we can't even begin to comprehend what it was, the, the kind of thing he went through. But he noticed uh, there was a man that was sitting in a meditative position and he seemed to be okay with everything. And so he asked the man what he was doing. The man said, you're breathing wrong. You don't know how to breathe. And so he taught him how to breathe, how to take a full breath in, hold it, let it out, do this just a few times, and become aware of that. Stop thinking about everything else. And that <clears throat> evolved into a yoga position, a stretching position where the mind went from all the problems he was having to what he was doing at that moment. And to make a very long story short, the moment came when he had a breakthrough, when suddenly something within him began to be made known that was very beautiful. And as he looked out at his captive environment, it, started meaning nothing to him. That the experience he was having, the spiritual awakening he was undergoing, was absolutely beautiful. And it, was, it didn't matter where he was physically. And that's the, an individual becoming aware of that image likeness of God that is within them. He actually became a Christian minister. The whole Christian message meant something entirely different to him from that point on. But he, he was released from prison. He was given 30 years. He was released after eight years. And he uh, couldn't get a job any place, so he became a teacher and a speaker in a seminar, led seminars and so on. He wrote a book. And he's all over the internet now. So if you do a search on him, you'll see that. But he changed his whole experience without changing the experience, without changing the external side of it. He said people started coming to him and said, what do you have? What are you, what's going on with you? You know, why are you happy? Why are you changing? What's, what, what's happening? I want that. I want some of that. And so he started teaching other people there and the guards became interested and he began to raise his status within that prison system. You'll have to listen to it. There's just so much to the interview that I don't want to try to encompass it all. But what the bottom line is, he was in a place that nobody would want to be in. If you think your life is bad, you got to listen to this guy. <laughs> you know, the, the times you think, I wish this was better, I wish that was better, and so on. This is getting down to the very worst thing you could possibly imagine that you are forced into. And this also is another aspect of how do you enter that narrow gate? You have to have incentive. There's got to be some motivation. Sometimes your life has to be so bad that you don't know where else to turn. You hit bottom. And so you then become open to a guy sitting across the cell with his eyes closed in a yoga position. And you say, what does he have that I don't? Why is he doing that? And so your mind opens to 
new questions, new possibilities. This is finding the treasure, the treasure hidden in the field. The reason the man sold everything he had to buy that treasure is because he recognized the value of it. And everything he possessed was not as valuable as that treasure. So he sold everything to buy that field. That's the whole concept here. This fellow in prison saw this guy sitting still and apparently was at peace with the world. And he was not at peace with himself. So I want some of that. How do I get it? And that's really the question. And not only how do I get it, but am I willing to stay with it until I do get it? Am I willing to actually sell everything I own to give up all my preconceptions so that I can have that feel, so I can have that treasure? And it's something we all ask ourselves. I don't stand up here saying to you, you must meditate. You must learn to experience God within yourself. I just say it's available. And most of us will look all through life, you know, trying to find solutions to our problems. And there are many problems. Just being in this body is a problem. But do we find happiness in all of our seeking? And that's what it comes down to is a genuine feeling that life is good, that life is absolutely good. And sometimes we don't get there until we are knocked to the floor. And we have to ask, where is the good in this? And we stay with it until we find it. And in this man's case, it was what we are talking about. It was that inner awakening. So I would uh, highly recommend listening to him. Albert Einstein said, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. I was reading some uh, physicists that were commenting on this and they were trying to downplay that Einstein didn't really mean what he said. He was a towering intellect, so he couldn't have possibly thought that the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. It's the other way around. The rational mind is the one we pay attention to, and that's true. But Einstein, and there are several occasions, he would say that he would be working on a problem and not be able to figure it out, then all of a sudden, when he wasn't thinking about it, it would come to him. The answer would come. And he considered that the intuitive way of learning. And <clears throat> what we're talking about here in the spiritual sense is further down or deeper than what Einstein's talking about here. Because we've all had that. Have you ever lost something? You look all over the house for it and you can't find it any place. You stop looking and Next thing you do, you walk over and pick it right up. You find it. That's the kind of um, intuitive insight that he's talking about. It's not the same thing we're talking about at the spiritual level. This is finding something that is absolutely real. But it is not apparent to the rational mind. While today's academic standards uh, reverse these values, it is through our intuitive faculty that we experience direct exposure to the spiritual reality that opens the narrow gate of true spiritual discovery. So as a minister, I can stand up here and talk about this all day long, which I've done, and it's head stuff. You know, this is, we've got to get to a point, every one of us in our own life, and probably most of you have, where you say, I want to know what this really is. I want to know what the experience of God is like. And we pursue that until we do experience it. The intellect builds its reality based on material appearances. Jesus said, do not judge by appearances. He pointed out that God is spirit. Like the wind, you cannot see it, but you see its effects. To worship in spirit is to go alone into your inner room to be still 
and come to know God as your living source. And that's the end of the story there. So <clears throat> the narrow gate is the intuitive faculty. Every one of us have it. And we're able to focus in on that one presence and one power. So it's up to each one of us to do it. But it's there, and it's not going to go away. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. It just keeps knocking. Thank you for watching this week's program. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with others. We want to reach as many people as we can, and we appreciate your help. If you'd like to help support this ministry, just click the donate card at the top right-hand corner of your screen. Your financial support means a lot to us. We have many subjects in our video lineup, so feel free to take a look. If there's a topic you don't see and would like me to address, just put it in the comment section. I'd love to know what's on your mind. To subscribe to this channel, simply click our logo. Thanks again for your interest in Independent Unity, and have a wonderful week.